This program deals with themes of an adult nature and is intended for a mature audience. If you like what you watch, then don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates on the KTPF Community Talk Show. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for our new weekly radio shows. To accompany the KTPF Community Talk Show, we now have our own free magazine to view online or download for free. Visit our website for more details. Also, the KTPF Community Talk Show is supported by Phenomenon Magazine and Beyond Parazine, available online now. The KTPF Community Talk Show is sponsored by Craigenos Castle, South Wales, one of the most haunted castles in Wales. For more information on ghostly and ghastly events, including fright nights, all night investigations and hen parties, Visit www.mosthauntedcastle.com The comments and views expressed on the KTPF Community Talk Show are those of the people that make them and do not necessarily reflect the views of ourselves or of our sponsors. Five, four, three, two, one. Landed. You're in the right place. place. Online, on the web, and on air. All over the world. Talk radio. You hear us, we hear you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the KTPF Community Talk Show live from Manchester on www.ktpf.co.uk. My name's Suzanne. And I'm Steve. And we're here bring, keeping the paranormal friendly with you every s Sunday, as always, and uh, bringing you a relaxed show full of supernatural, paranormal, and other strange phenomena, uh, including conspiracy theories at times. So sit back and relax while we share information, advice, and most importantly, friendship. Remember, collaboration, not competition. This show incorporates a wide spectrum of this within these fascinating subjects so if you have any questions you can use the live interactive chat room where we will ask our guests for you or you can Skype in and speak directly to our guests by adding the KTPF paranormal show. Okay later we will have the rundown of this month's events provided by our sister site at paranormaleventsforyou.com and I'd just like to acknowledge everybody who's listening including those on our radio replay. Right so what's on for tonight? This week we talk about out-of-body experiences, OBEs or sometimes OOBE, Ubies. Ubies, which is an experience that typically involves the sensation of floating outside your body when you go to sleep at night. Now the term out-of-body experience was introduced in, the in 1943 by George N. M. Tyrell in his book Apparitions and was adopted by researchers such as Celia Green and Robert Munro as an alternative to belief centric labels such as astral projection, soul travelling or sp spirit walking. Scientists regularly regarded OBEs as, as uh, disassociative experiences arising from different psychological and neurological uh, factors. Um, those experiencing OBE sometimes reports amongst others, um, sorry, those experiencing OBEs sometimes report a proceeding and initiating lucid dream state. Um, in my, many cases, people who claim to have had an OBE report being on the verge of sleep or being already asleep shortly before the experience. Well, we'll talk to somebody tonight who is a lifelong practitioner in this phenomenon, so that should be quite interesting, shouldn't it, Steve? It should indeed. And I'd also like to make you all aware that Mr. Andy Mann is not with us this week. No, I know. It's a shame, isn't it? It is. He's having an early birthday treat with his missus. And that might sound a little bit yeah. weird, but he's he's out at the theatre um, so tonight, yes. seeing somebody that he really likes. Yes, she has purchased tickets. Yes, so uh, that's where he is. So um, I'd just like to um, uh, thank everyone who's listening tonight. There's yeah. quite a few of you out there. If you'd like to join us in the yeah. chat room. The Vector Man has, has checked in with us. Yep, um, and then... Uh, 
you can join in the conversation that uh, goes on there. And uh, don't forget, as I said, that this, these shows are recorded for our radio replay purposes on the YouTube channel. So if you like what you hear, you can go and listen to the rest of the shows that we've broadcasted for the past three years. So there's quite a few there on quite a few varied topics as well. Well, but without no further ado, further ado, we're going to hand over to Steve. With the observations. And good evening, all. To, I'm sure you're going to realise I am going to get tongue-tied tonight. Yes, and before you do, I just want to let everybody know, don't forget that we're using live stream, so if it goes off, just refresh it. We will do the same if we have a problem. But touch wood, it's been fine so far for the past few weeks, so hopefully we'll be all right. Oh, here we go. Uh, model Charlotte Dawson's ghost is haunting me. A former top model... Co- Contestant claims the ghost of Charlotte Dawson is haunting her, uh, but the visits are not scary. Mm-hmm. Simone Hotznagel, who placed third in 2011 cycle of Australia's Next Top Model, told the uh, Hevel Dawson had visited her three times since she died in February last year. Dawson was Miss Hotznagel's mentor on the reality show, and the two were close, so close that Dawson, who's Miss Hot Nagel called Mama, had entrusted the younger woman with keys to her home. We spoke every day. We would see each other a few days during the week. Every Sunday, we would have lunch on the wolf, Miss Hot Nagel said. The young model who moved to pursue her career in acting and modelling uh, to the United States in 2013 even claimed to have identified the star's body after her death. We did everything together. We ID'd her body. That's how close we were. Uh, the visits were not scary, said Dawson. Her uh, presence was quite... with the ghost almost whispering when she spoke, Miss Hotsnickel claimed. Whispering ghosts. Uh, it happened once at my grandma's house, again when I moved into my place in L.A., and just the other night in my hotel room in Amsterdam. Yeah. That's not on there. <laughs> See, told you, didn't put that one on. Uh, as it happens, my grandma's house. Oh yes, where we were. You can force me now. Sorry, dear. Amsterdam. Here we go. Uh, it's most surreal thing that's ever happened to me. She said the first two times I, I felt someone sit on my bed right next to me, and then feeling a weight on my forearm. The other night was the first night I actually had the courage to turn and look. She said when it happened the other night. She said it's okay a few times. And she was just saying along the lines of, you, you know that this time last year was really rough. It's Hot Snaggle claimed that the visits happened when she was still wide awake and said she did not think she was imagining things. Mm. I definitely do not think being overtired is the case, she said. It happened to me more than once and I remember things like what happened since I was about 14. Charlotte Dawson was found dead in a luxury waterside apartment at Woolamulu, Sydney, in February last year. Dawson, a t- television personality and former model, had struggled with depression for years and had been the target of cyberbullying through cyber- social media. Oh dear. They just, they just can't read and leave themselves alone, can they, these idiots on, on, on Facebook and the likes. Mm. They think they think they can say and do what they want just because you don't know who they are. Yep. Okay, what's next? There we go. Post there we go. Posted. Okay. Posted. Is this the world's most haunted town? Ghost girl in red dress, grey figure spotted in cemetery. Toowoomba in Australia has been ho- home to a record amount of spooky sightings over the past five years. A ghostly figure in a red dress and a grey figure standing as if mourning over a grey stone are pictured in what could be the world's most haunted town. Toowoomba in, in Australia has been a record number of spooky sightings. I just uh, sorry, I thought I'd just done that bit over the last five years from a weird grave hopping figure in grey, a supernatural blue mist. Dozens of creepy pictures were unearthed by ghost hunters. When Carly Samuels and, and Katie Harver, 
set up the Toowoomba Ghost Chasers Facebook page, they were inundated with pictures of bizarres going on. Dozens of reported supernatural sightings were documented with chilling pictures and video evidence. Paranormal investigator Darren Davis used his high-tech ghost hunting equipment to examine a haunted pub. He told the Toowoomba Chronicle, It's quite a dark history. There have been a, a number of sudden as well as natural deaths at the inn. Another spook sleuth, Aaron Mulligan, believes the lady in the red dress to be Elizabeth Perkins. Uh, she was a resident of the town who died after being hit by a train in 1944. Aaron took his ghost detecting K2 meter to the site and in the Daily Mail Australia we went there and ran through the names of some people. When we got to her the K2 meter lit up and then I asked if it was Elizabeth Perkins. Then there was footsteps and she definitely walked past. Reporter Amelia saw from Woman's Day magazine went to visit the spooky town. She said, I thought it might be a struggle to find people who would speak to me about haunted stuff. But they all just came out of the woodwork from all walks of life. My favourite is the story of Carly Samuels, who lived in this house that used to be owned by an undertaker. Every time she puts a crucifix on the wall, it just flicks off. It's happened time and time again. There's been no wind or any other explanation for it. When she asked about the ghost of Toowoomba, that Darren said, people basically fear the unknown, but we know what to expect. There you go, they know what to expect. Right, okay. Toowoomba, I, I, I'm sure I've done one on Toowoomba before. Mm -hmm. Sounds familiar. Mm. And why would it, it's such a strange name. Toowoomba. Toowoomba. A bit like Pumba. 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 Is it a cross between Pumba and Timon? Maybe. You never know. Oh, there's the next one. The haunted lighthouse of Tevenek has been inhabited for more than a hundred years. One of France's most terrifying places to live will finally have a guest stay at his infamous lighthouse for 60 days. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. The lighthouse at Tevenek has a dark and haunting reputation located a short distance from the Pont de, R de Raz in western Brittany, France. A haunted lighthouse that has had its share of people going insane, suspicious deaths including children and people falling on knives and ghost sightings according to the story by Weiss. In 1875 the lighthouse w was lit for the first time. The first haunted town involved Henry Guzanek, uh, the first lighthouse keeper and guard to, to live at the desolated isolation location. Uh, the legend suggests the guard went completely mad while living there and, and watching guard at the lighthouse. Mark Pointed, uh, founder of the National Society of Heritage Lighthouse and Beacons, plans to make history and live in the remote lighthouse for 60 days. It is an attempt to raise awareness of the forgotten landmark while celebrating the lighthouse 140 year anniversary. Okay. Mark Pointed explains to Vice why he plans to stay at the haunted house lighthouse. No, excuse me, knowing others have gone mad from the total isolation and loneliness, uh, that is ex exactly what this is about. Solitude is Tevenex Keeper's tradition. Between 1874 and 1910, the lighthouse needed a new keeper every year. Uh, nobody could last longer, but, but it was a different time and you were, weren't able to communicate with the outside world. You basically only had the birds to talk to. It would be much easier for me. I'll be in touch with both the media and my association all the time. There you go. Mm. A haunted lifestyle of Tevec. Interesting. So. Okay, so I, I cut that one a little bit short because there's a lot, okay. of, a lot of babble there. But different things. I'm sure you can read it for yourselves. You can indeed. Here comes your next one. Here comes the next one. Paste. Okay, got this one comes from Weird World. Uh, sorry, a week in Weird. Weird. Here we go. If you follow me on Twitter, you'll know that I routinely pursue, pursue, per, peruse uh, Reddit at one at one, one o'clock in the morning and search for paranormal terrors. More often than not, I end up wide awake, sure I heard something scratching at my bedroom window. Last night was no different. 
I found a post written by a user, kill a fish finger. <laughs> Why would you call yourself kill a fish finger? <laughs> In the paranormal subreddit entitled, found this photograph on my phone, have no memory of taking it. So obviously, I took the bait. And I found a photo uh, I didn't take. Trope is actually a pretty common one as, as far as the internet scares go. And they're usually, usually <clears throat> quick to disappoint. This picture, however, might be a different story. The post started that the owner of the picture had found it later the next day, but when he checked the details and the image in question had been taken at 22.51.22, which would have been impossible because he was sleeping by that time. At first glance, the image is pretty boring, showing just two bright, inconspicuous lights that could belong to anything. Mm. Big deal, right? Another user, 101, decided to bring up the gamma in, in order to get a better look at what was happening in the darker sections of the image. And that's when things got a whole lot more interesting. The strange photo shows what looks like an awful lot like a man standing in the field looking up at a mechanical object hovering in the night sky. And according to Killer Fishfinger, the man in the image isn't him. All oh, right. So, ah, you thought it was going to be him then, didn't you? Mm. According, to, according to the OP, the faint tree line in the upper right-hand side of the photo somewhat matches the same row from a nearby wood at the front of his property. He explained that he lived alone and had no idea who the other person in the image might be. Obviously, uh, there were many theories about the image. Some users thought it, it looked as if the picture had been taken inside and that the flash was act actually caused from Killyfinger's phone. Mm. However, that wouldn't explain the mysterious man standing in his lawn, nor the fact that he had absolutely no memory of taking the picture in the first place. Looks like he's got some sort of anorak on. Hmm. Uh, the other people uh, thought maybe Killyfinger had been sleepwalking or perhaps that had been using an app that had saved the image to his camera roll without his knowledge. And of course there are many who thought what we're all thinking, that Killer Fishfinger had visited in the night and possibly taken a weird UFO. What do you think? you think it's a weird UFO, Susie? Yeah, well, not, I don't know. The first thing I thought of, may, it may have been a droid, or one of them drone things with lights on the front, like headlights. Yeah. But when you said about the man, I, I don't know. Yeah, because you, you thought that was going to be him, didn't yeah. you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Spectrum man said there's something fishy about that picture. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just a bit, cause, uh, cause it, cause it, especially as you thought, if that was him, mm. who took the picture? Well, this is it. <laughs> so, right, okay. Is that your last one? An hour now. Okay, back to the next <laughs> one. Back to the next one. So, what have we got next? A series of strange ghost photos recently popped up on Reddit. Again, oh, I, yeah. I'm going to have a look at this Reddit. Uh, showing what appeared to be strange, shadowy, lurking figures near a group of, of men shoveling snow off the ice. Great. Right. Only according to the photographer, no one was there at the time. Surprise, surprise. The picture was posted by user Ashley93 and according to her was snapped by her neighbour one night this past winter when his three sons were helping sh shovel during a storm. The two images were taken on the neighbour's phone only seconds apart and as they can see the first image shows nothing out of the ordinary and the second image however is very different. In the second photo you can make out what, according to Ashley 93, looks an awful lot like two dark figures moving by. Ashley believes that the image, which were posted on Friday evening, also shows the figure pulling a coffin behind them as they go. I didn't see the coffin, but hey, maybe I don't know where to look. It's further down. Uh -huh. of, of course, the images spark plenty of debate about their validity and lots of theories about what could have caused the strange skeletal shapes in the snow. Plenty of people suggest that the pictures were the result of a rolling shutter effect, poor lighting and slow shutter speed, capturing a few skaters rolling by, although the poster assured that no one else was present when the image was taken. Chances are uh, over the, the next few days you'll be seeing Astley's strange skeleton images during the rounds on the internet, so let's get the ball rolling here. Shall we? Uh, what do you think of the weird images? 
Mm. And that, as they say, I don't know. I, I, that, it looks to me as though there's some sort of camera, not trickery, but um, you know, something going wrong. Because I think the first picture, the shadowing you can see right next to the blokes, could be their reflection from the lights or whatever. Yeah, that. Um, yeah. But that other thing, I don't know. I really don't know. And then, as you say, I'm still not when you say, I'm, firm, still, I'm still not seeing the coffin. Well, if you go further down, there's a bigger one, right? And the coffin-like shape is above the picture of the actual um, supposed figure. Yeah, right. So, but I don't know. Um, jury's out on that one. It doesn't look quite right to me. But then again, no. what do you think, guys, in the chat room? Well, I, I agree that the ones below them is uh, is probably shadows from the light from mm. them. But what that other thing is there, I don't know. I don't know. Well, I've got a two-penneth. A tuppence. A tuppence. Go for your tuppence. Right. Coronation Street is said to be haunted. Claims now Again. set. Uh, claims the new set is cursed after a string of mishaps. And according to Paul Britton of the Manchester Evening News, the show sources have claimed that a string of mishaps and bad luck are d down to spirits and not just those behind the Rover's bar. The cast and crew of Coronation Street believe the sh Soap's new set is haunted, according to reports. The famous street and its cobbles moved from the centre of Manchester to a flash new £10 million production base at Salford Quays last year. But sources have claimed that since the move, the set and cast have been hit by a string of mishaps and bad luck. Now it's been claimed that the new site behind, uh, sorry, beside uh, Manchester Ship Canal is being haunted by the spirits of a long dead docker, dock workers. Um, many men lost their lives there during its construction and operation from 1894 onwards. A show source told our sister paper, The Mirror, it may sound far-fetched, but people are openly saying the site is haunted. Every time something goes wrong, the cry goes up, we are cursed. At first it was seen as a joke, but believe it or not, some have convinced themselves it is true. It has even been suggested, albeit light-heartedly, that an exorcist should be invited on the set. There are reports that the show has been hit by a flu outbreak since the move, and it was sound, soundly beaten by EastEnders at the recent British Soap Awards in London. A number of staffs, top, uh, sorry, a number of the show's top staffs have also left. Now I've phoned these up, being the paranormal investigator I am. <laughs> <laughs> I phoned up um, ITV to offer UK Shadow Seekers. Um, assistance if, to see whether they'll be interested and they gave me the email address and also I left them message on uh, the producer um, uh, producer's phone and he very kindly rang me back That's nice of him. it was nice of him and uh, he basically basically said that um, it's not haunted he admits that the last one was haunted which, which if you're a seasoned um, Investigator, you would have heard that as well. You would have already seen it on, on uh, most haunted. most haunted as well because yes. they went. I think they went. Yes, they went to the old one. Yeah, but um, he assures me because they said it was Pat Phoenix, didn't they? Yes, the but he assures me that everything seems fine. So, um, uh, as I say, uh, I won't tell you what he actually said because um, it, it it might he might want it kept to himself. But uh, he does ensure me that there's nothing wrong at the new set, um, and he thinks that the uh, the article in question is fabricated. So um, that so if if there's any seasoned or any paranormal investigators creators thinking of actually ringing them up and or contacting them, um, now you know. <laughs> So, but um, but yes, uh, sadly it's not haunted, so we won't be going in there to uh, investigate. But um, yeah. So, what do you think to that, Steve? Uh, no offence, but I think if it was, then we couldn't afford what they wanted to, would want to charge us anyway. No, I know this is it. That's All the about the money. All about the money. 
Right, guys. Well, thank you for joining us in the chat room tonight. As um, I say, we've got Vectra Man, we've got my yeah. count. Because um, he's just popped in from, from the reception, the reception. of mosthauntedcastle.com. Yes. And uh, those that are listening in the background. Uh, don't forget tonight, guys. Um, it's your last chance to enter for the free book that I've got. Um, by yeah. our guest. Yeah, Daryl was uh, kind enough to, to send us two. Yes. One, um, one we shall obviously be keeping ourselves. Travel Far, a beginner's guide to the outer body experience, including first hand accounts and comprehensive theories and methods by Daryl E. Berry, uh, Jr., that is. Um, if you want to be in a chance to win, win a copy of this, please send your name and your location um, to show at ktpf.co.uk and after the interview we will be calling out the name of the winner of the uh, of the book and something about something out about uh, postage and stuff this is me I won <laughs> <laughs> so that's what's coming up there um, and uh, on the subject of this um, let's uh, just uh, give you a bit of an introduction before we contact um, Daryl um, out of body experiences now, as I said before at the start of the show, um, OBEs, are, or sometimes called UBEs, double O-B-E, is an experiment that typically involves a sensation of floating outside your body uh, when you go to sleep at night. Any of you actually, um, any of you actually uh, experience one of these? Uh, good evening, Mozzie. Uh, Mossy, Mossy. Are you the young man that actually emailed me recently? Um, <laughs> are you local? Are you in the UK? <laughs> <laughs> uh, welcome as a first time listener. Yep. Yep. Is that yep to both of them? <laughs> right, okay. Uh, I did send you an email. Oh, right, okay. I sent you an email, by the way, uh, a reply. Um, okay. Uh, that's probably just answered my question. But as I say... Um, it was originally introduced in 1943 by George N. M. Tyrell in his book Apparitions. I know I'm repeating myself, but some people have just joined us. And was adopted by researchers such as Celia Green and Robert Monroe as an alternative to belief-centric labels such as ast astral projection. Let's make that a bit bigger than I can ever read what I wrote. Uh, souls to have all and or spirit walking. Now, scientists generally regarded OBEs as dissociative. That's a big word. Dissociative experiences um, arising from different psychological and neurological factors. Those experiencing OBEs sometimes report, among other types of immediate and spontaneous experiences, a preceding and initiating lucid dream state. In many cases, people who claim to have an OBE report being on the verge of sleep or being already asleep shortly before the experience. Uh, OBEs can be in induced by brain traumas, sensory dep deprivation, near-death experiences, uh, dissociative or psych psychedelic drugs, um, dehydration, sleep, and electrical stimulation of the brain. Um, amongst others, it can also be delib deliberately induced by some. Could that be the case with our, with our um, guest this evening? One in ten people have had an OBE once or more commonly, um, several times in their life. Daryl E. Barry, uh, sorry, Daryl E. Berry, I should say, yep. <laughs> uh, is a long-time practitioner in out-of-body experiences and astral travel. And he says he has met the deceased, interacted with extraterrestrials, travelled through time, transversed outer space, and inter interacted with spiritual beings. Um, with his latest book uh, released this weekend, uh, it was brought forward to this weekend. We're going to find out more. So uh, hopefully Daryl is available. It's just coming up to half past eight now. So we'll get him on the phone and uh, speak to well, on on Skype, I will say, not the phone. And we'll speak to him. Good evening, Daryl. Hey, can you hear me okay? Are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me okay? Yes, that's fine. Uh, welcome oh. to the show. Awesome. Thank you. 
Okay. Thank, you for, Thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. You're welcome. Now, um, Daryl, you're a long-term practitioner of out-of-body experiences. Okay. That's right. When did this start with you, and when did you realize what was going on? My experiences first started when I was four or five years old. And uh, what happened was I basically started feeling very heavy and lethargic. It was around dusk, around you know, before dark, but still not really nighttime. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was so unusual that I told my mom I was going to go uh, lay down and, and get some rest until I felt better. So I went and lay down in bed. And as I as I got to bed, I felt more and more heavy. And uh, by the time I got to bed, I plopped myself onto the bed and went to sleep. Hmm. Uh, and at some point during the night, I'm not sure how long went by, I, I suddenly felt better. I felt amazing, actually. So I figured I would get up and tell my mom that I was feeling better so she wouldn't be worried. So I got up out of bed and, and went to go and tell her. But when I went to open up the door, I went through the doorknob. So uh, when I realized that I couldn't open the door and I realized I can probably go through the door, I walked through the door and walked through the inventing walls. Mm. And I went and I, uh, you know, I tried to get my mom's attention in the kitchen. She was in the kitchen cleaning up and things like that. Uh, but I noticed that no sound was coming from my, from my mouth. I couldn't make a sound. And uh, but and I, after a certain amount of time, I just lost the word and woke up in the morning. And, uh, you know, I went and told my mom about it. You know, she told me I was dreaming or whatever. But I was able to tell her things she was doing in the kitchen during that period of time. So that was that was my first experience in, in hmm. my introduction to it. Did, did it feel real to you? Was there any mist around or anything? Or was it hazy? Well, not during that experience. It, it could be because I was inside. Yeah. Uh, at, at, at that time, it just seemed normal. Until, until my hand went through the door, mm-hmm. I thought I was I thought I was in my physical body. But uh, the experience started happening more and more frequently. And whenever it was a certain period of time, mm-hmm. maybe the span of a few years, where I would habitually walk down the street out of body, and every single time I had a street walking experience. A uh, Mr. Hayes filled the entire environment. Wow. Uh, the environment took on a monotone, bluish type color. Yeah. And uh, and there was Mr. Hayes everywhere. So but so every single night walking experience I had during that period of time, it was Mr. Hayes uh, all throughout the era. Right. Okay. Now, um, as you say, you started as a child doing this. How did you feel? Um, did you feel weird and different between you know between you and the other people? Well. Actually, no, because at the time I didn't, like my mom said it was just a dream or what have you, but I didn't really pay much mind to it because it was such a real experience to me. And when I went back to school, I noticed none of the kids were talking about it, and, and it got to the point where I started to get better and better at it, Yeah. and I was flying around and things like that. So I really started to assume that pretty much everybody did it, but it was just so common and nobody talked about it, you know? Uh, uh, you know, like we don't really talk about, we don't make a big conversation about how we tie our shoes in the yeah. morning. We just tie our shoes. So that's how I thought. I was like, wow, I wonder what everybody else does when they fly around at night, you know? So I just took it as, took it as a common thing. Uh, it wasn't until probably middle school or high school that I started to realize that not, not many people were into it. I think I, I just, uh, you know, just started uh, researching it and, and finding out more about it and realized it was sort of a mystical or paranormal thing. But, you know, as a child, I just thought it was just some kind of normal thing that everybody did and, and, and nobody just talked about it because it was so common. Mm, right. So, as you say, your, your mother, obviously, she didn't understand um, what you was going through as a child. And... Um, was there in later life? Did you start speaking to people about this? Uh, uh, I would say um, when I got a, around high school, I started uh, speaking speaking to people who were into it. Like if I went to a metaphysical bookstore, what have you? Yeah. Uh, especially around that time, there was a lot of online activity. Mm. Uh, I know there was a certain period of time. Right now, it seems to be the big thing is like social media websites. But at one period of time, it was all about chat rooms. And I would go into a lot of chat rooms and talk to people about it. And I guess when I started to really learn that it was sort of a, uh, a not so common thing, uh, like a lot of people would refer to me as having a gift or, or something like that. But I mean, over the decades, I found it's not 
it's really just a skill that anybody can develop. You know, it, it may be something that I was more easily able to fall into because maybe I developed it in other lifetimes or what have you. Mm. Uh, uh, but it's just a skill that anybody can develop and, and actually learn that everybody really does it already. Uh, if you if you if you're out of body enough, and I mean you know I started when I was a kid, but you know I didn't I didn't I haven't done it consistently during that period of time. Like I had long breaks of of not practice, but you know over the decades I've gotten a lot of experiences in. Yeah. And uh, you know a, a lot of times I will see people out of body. Uh, sometimes they would seem conscious. Uh, sometimes they would seem like they were drunk or in some kind of haze, mm-hmm. uh, but it's just usually it, it, it is would not remember it is, is all it was. But, you know, even then you'll be able to discern something about their life that you can confirm later or, 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 or what have you. So, but the fact is, is it's really a normal experience that, that people, uh, that's a normal part of our, our lives. Right. Okay. Now I believe that, um, I want to go through some of the, the stories with you that you've you've encountered. One of them, I believe, you met yourself in the future during an OBE. Yes. Can you tell us about this? Yes, I did. Uh, what happened was this is one of those experiences where it was spontaneous. Like I didn't initiate the experience consciously. Uh, I don't even know where my physical body was. I'm not even sure what time. I just know it was sometime in my in my childhood or teenage years. Yeah. Uh, I was just suddenly in a room, and. Uh, 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 and I had a few experiences. This is one of them. I was suddenly in a room and I had no control over my body. All I knew was I was looking through someone's eyes. I didn't even know it was my eyes. I was just looking through someone's eyes. I had no control over their movements. I could just see the environment as if their eyes were windows. And, uh, suddenly the person I noticed he was, he or she, whoever it was, was writing these little, uh, notes on these little, paper tabs and sticking them to these plastic bags. So I don't mm. really know what was going on. And suddenly this person started looking around the room frantically, just looking around the room frantically, looking up at the ceiling, just looking around as if they were in some kind of shock or saw something unexpectedly. And then the person just went to starting writing on these little tabs again. So at, at, at that point, this, the experience suddenly ended and I don't really know what to make of it. I just, I just thought of it as, a, as an interesting experience. And, uh, Years later, I unexpectedly moved, and I sold incense for a living at that time. Like I, w- I would buy incense wholesale, and uh, you know, put them in these plastic bags and write the write the scent of the incense on these little tabs and paste the incense uh, flavor on there. And I walk around selling incense. Well, one morning when I was getting ready to go out and sell, suddenly I was just aware that this was the moment that was happening. And I was able to look and see what I was doing. And when, when the experience hit me that this is what I was noticing, I started to look around the room frantically to, to discern, is this really that room? Then I realized, wow, this is why the person was looking around the room frantically. It was me realizing that I'm in my body right now from the past and putting all the pieces together. So, uh, you know, it was quite an interesting experience. Uh, another experience I had where I saw myself from the future, this was one of my childhood experiences where I spontaneously floated up to the ceiling. I, I had several experiences where I spontaneously floated out the body. A lot of the times I would just sort of lay at the ceiling. Yeah. And other, other times I would, I would do other things. Well, this time I became aware of the sensation of floating, which I, what I, which I became aware of was the out-of-body experience. But this time when I opened up my awareness, I opened up my perceptions, Mm -hmm. I was several stories above the house. I was able to look down and see the roof of the house. I was able to see the neighborhood. I was able to look up and see outer space as I floated seemingly uncontrollably higher and higher. And uh, in my state of terror, I thinking I would be lost in space because, you know, at, at the moment I was in such shock, I had no control of the experience. Suddenly, I saw myself to the side. I saw, I saw a future version of myself looking very calmly at me, and it was just—it it was just such a striking experience that it totally shook me out of my fright uh, at being lost in space. And I just—I just looked at myself, which, I, which ironically, of course, looks how much how I look now. Yeah. And uh, and I just looked at myself looking at me, and uh, this future self was just calm. Uh, uh, just, 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 just like a wise, calm 
future mature me is looking at me. And, and of course, uh, years later, I will read the works of people like Robin Monroe who have similar experiences, you know. So a lot of these things, I just took it as at face value because it was just my experience. But, you know, over the years, as I started to read more and more about it, more and more of my experiences I was able to see mirrored uh, in the experiences of others, both con contemporary as well as uh, 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 more more uh, ancient or arcane writers. Yeah. Okay. Hi, hi Daryl. Hello. <laughs> I am, I'm Steve. Hello. <clears throat> nice to meet you. And you, uh, what you experienced there uh, seems to defy the laws of physics. Physics, we're having two essences or energies of the same person in the same place at the same time. Why do you think this is? And are you not in danger of changing your own future by meeting your future self? Right. That's a very uh, a good question, and it actually relates ironically to a lot of the findings that are starting to manifest at the forefront of our science, like quantum physics. The fact is, time is simultaneous. Like, we experience time as being past, pro proceeding to present, proceeding to future. But the fact is, all time is now. There is no, no, no true division amongst time as far as being unable to access different aspects of time. So, if I go into the future, and I influence the future. It may seem sort of like I influenced the future, hmm. but all that happened is in the one instant of time, that's just one of the ways that it plays out. Uh, uh, a very good example is uh, like our movies. Like if you look at a movie, a movie is all, is all made out right now. Like when you go to a movie theater and watch a movie, when we're sitting in the movie, it looks as if the future hasn't come yet. But the fact is, when we get into hour one of the movie, what we're seeing now, even though it's new to us, has already happened. It's already been filmed, right? Everything that the present, our future is experiencing as far as the movie is concerned, has already been influenced by the past. Has already been written. Is already there. Yeah. So that's the way. That's the way the universe really is. Everything that we do that seems to go into the future and, and influence it, or everything we seem to do. Because that, that experience is a perfect example. In that experience, I influenced my past from the future. Because I went into the future out of body. I saw what was happening there, which, which influenced my past mind, as you can see. Which then influenced my future because when I, went, when I was in that time in the present, I reacted based upon the knowledge I learned of the future from the past. And it was kind of complex. Hopefully it's coming out clear enough. So it seems as if the past influenced the future, the future, the future influenced the past. But from the greater temporal perspective, it all happens simultaneously. And just like a movie, like a script, it's just all written out. So that's the way it plays out. So that being the case, space is the same way. So you can, you can, you can, you can meet yourself out of body. There's no uh, 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 threat like a lot of these science fiction movies nowadays. Like I remember there was a, a movie that came out recently, which I really liked. It was called... Uh, I can't remember what it was called, but these these teenagers just found this time time machine yeah. uh, that that the guy's father made. But what happened is when they went through time and met themselves, they made themselves wink out of existence. And there's all kind of different scientific ideas, like you know, science fiction ideas like that. But that just doesn't happen. Uh, you can meet yourself. Matter of fact, we regularly meet ourselves. Uh, Robert Monroe met himself. If you if you read Robert Monroe's book, uh, when he was new to the out of body experience, he was sort of being uh, I don't know if you want to say harassed by these or, or bothered by these non-physical entities and his future more mature, more adept out of body self went into the past and got those non-physical entities off of him. His past self thought some spirit guy came and helped him, but it was actually him coming from the future. Right. But he had he had developed so much from that point into the future that it looked it seemed like a totally different person so this kind of stuff happens all the time there, there's no there's no no danger of, of killing yourself or, or or disrupting the time space continuum the fact is there is no uh, uh limit to time and we we regularly in, interact with time you know it's, it's really a regular thing I mean, you know, one of, one of the things I've noticed about myself is, especially when I get more into meditation, I have a, I've always had a tendency to be slightly aware of the future. Like, we all have different tendencies. That's just one of my tendencies. Like, for instance, um, during one of my high meditation periods when I was practicing OBE a lot, 
and I was reading a lot at the same time, learning about all this stuff. And one regular thing that would happen was, let's say I would be sitting down watching TV, and I would hear myself reading in my mind. I would just suddenly hear myself reading. You know, when you read, you, mm-hmm. you hear yourself saying the words in your mind. Yeah. And uh, let's say a week or two later, I would go buy a book, a brand new book that I never read before, that I may have never even heard of before. And I would start reading the book. And let's say I would get the page 20 in the book, and I would say, wow. I would, I would start reading what I heard myself reading a week or two before. And this would happen regularly. I mean, very regularly. Uh, uh, not to mention a whole lot of those deja vu experiences where, you know, this is just a, a common tendency that I had. So in my experience, the only thing that causes us to, uh, 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 experience time as some sort of detriment to our awareness is our own denial. Yeah. Right. The fact is we, we want to experience ourselves as an individual, as a, as a finite being to keep our individuality intact to keep expansiveness at bay. And one of the ways that we do that is to pretend that the demarcation that we call time actually has a limiting effect upon our awareness. Uh, one, one good example of this is that relates to the out of experience as well. When I was a kid, the first time that I could have had sex as a kid, it was this slightly older chick wanted to have sex with me, but I was like very young. I, I was, I was, I was uh, afraid and I ran off and, and went to play. But as I, as I started to become aware of, uh, you know, of, of, uh, of what was going on with my out about experiencing, and I said, wow, you know, maybe I could consciously travel through time. So I figured, oh, let me go back in time and see what would have happened. And I started yeah. to become aware that we have alternate timelines and so forth. And this, I was around 20 or whatever when I did this. I went into an altered state, which I was practicing a lot at the time, so I was able to do it, get into an altered state in like a minute. And I went back in time. And when I, when I went back in time, I entered my body as a child. And it wasn't like when I went into the future. When I went into the future, I was in my body. I was just looking through a window, you know. At, when I went into the past, I actually was my childhood itself. Like, all of my thoughts were exactly as I was at the time. Everything I did was exactly the way it was at the time. The only thing I did was make that one different choice which was to, to have that experience with, with that uh, uh, other young female. And when the experience ended and I came back into my present body, I had a memory of two, I had two different memories for that same, same time period. But relevant to, to our experience of time was when I went back in time and had my, my experience at that time, I was that self. In other words, even though I had over a decade experience you know after that period of time a decade of knowledge a decade of experience a decade of sexual sexual experience all of that was not it was not accessible to me no. i was how old i was at that time i was experiencing it as far as my awareness was concerned for the first time so what that led me to to understand is that even now even right now where where, where we seem to be talking and having this conversation Unaware of what's going to be said the next five minutes from now, the next hour from now, you know, unaware of what's going to happen next year. The fact is we are aware of it. Just like when I went back in time and I totally denied and and repressed knowledge of my future experiences. So I can truly experience that moment in time as if it was the first time and truly experience what would have happened. And what did happen in that alternate timeline, because I've come to understand that I actually experienced an alternate timeline. So even now, we are aware of everything, but accept and repress it so that we can have the illusory experience of being a finite being in a finite space at a finite time, aware of the past and unaware of the future. Uh, you know, but, but, but we're, we're, subconsciously, we're aware of everything. Uh, subconsciously, we're, we're, we're constantly influencing the past and influencing the future. It plays out as if we're experiencing the past and experiencing the future and, 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 and manipulating or influencing either, either way. But in truth, from the, from the large perspective, it all happens at once. And just like a movie right. where the, okay. the, the director and the writers write everything in the future and write everything in the past and make it all blend together in a certain way, that's what we're actually doing in, in real life. Right. Now, we've got a couple of questions in the chat room. Um, Mos, Mossy, which, uh, again, thanks for joining us, Mossy. Um, 
you sort of answered part of his question, but it also interlinks with Dave Lloyd's question. Um, he, Mossy would like to know, when you travel backwards and forwards, um, what did you see, which you've explained? He said, if it was in the future, what's going to happen? And Dave Lloyd said, do you ever experience things and find out, like, for instance, who is going to be the next United States president? Are you able to foretell anything like that? I'm certain you can, because, but I just never, I just never, uh, I never, that never really inter interested me enough to actually put my mind into it, you know, because like if I can be aware of what I'm going to read when I haven't read it yet, uh, or, and if I could be aware of that experience that I had, uh, you could, you could experience that too. And, uh, if you, if you research like remote viewing, remote viewers do that a lot, you know, uh, uh, this is one guy who, uh, who actually remote views lottery numbers. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that's how he made his living. He, he just remote views small lotteries and, and, and wins lotteries that way. So it's definitely possible because all time is now, really? you know, uh, uh, so you can go and see who the president is and go and see who you're going to marry. Matter of fact, uh, one of my friends, Lewis, I, I mentioned him in the book. I don't know if you had, uh, saw mention of him, but he's, you know, I, I consider myself, you know, I'm an expert on the subject and, you know, but I, I've, I've dabbled compared to what he does, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? He, he was addicted. And, uh, and uh, I mean, that's all he did. And, and for years and years and years, uh, I mean, he, all of his free time, that's what he did. And uh, he, would, he would regularly go into the future and see who he was going to meet. Like, he would tell me, I'm going to meet this girl, you know, such and such a day. Like, he would go see who his future girlfriends would be and, and all kind of stuff like that. So it, it's definitely possible to do that. Uh, I just never, you know, I, it, never, it, has, it wasn't much of a, big deal for me to do that uh, i would say the the driving force for me when i was really getting really deep into it was like spiritual development and metaphysical development so you know i wasn't so interested in just trying to predict the future with it mm -hmm. okay. okay yeah there, there seems to be several different ways to uh, to have an obe or visit the astral plane and they they all seem to mention the risk of sleep paralysis just before you leave the body how can you prevent this from happening Right. Well, in my experience, you you really can't prevent it from happening. Uh, uh, in in my experience and research, I found that ultimately, even though there's many different methods, like you were saying, and and I even teach many different methods per se, but ultimately, ultimately, no matter what method you find, no matter what school of thought you find on the subject, ultimately, there's really only one way. Only one way to have an out of, out of body experience, and only one way that you ever have an out of body experience, and is this: your physical body goes to sleep, and your conscious awareness remains intact. That's it. That's the foundation. No matter what technique you do, no matter what process or practice you use, ultimately that's what happens, right? And every time we go to sleep. It's a natural part of sleep to have what we call paralysis. It's basically described as a mechanism that prevents our physical body from acting out what we experience in our dreams. You know, when people have, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, when this process doesn't work perfectly within them, that's when people, you see them moving in their sleep, and some people might start punching in their sleep. You know, the paralysis prevents us from doing that. So it happens every time. Uh, when you don't experience paralysis, all that means is that your, your awareness went to your awareness was not intact consciously through the entire experience where you missed that experience. You know, a person might go into an altered state and suddenly find themselves floating into the air, but what happened is they, they lost awareness briefly and missed that, that, that paralysis moment. Uh, uh, but in a lot of people, of course, they don't experience the out of body experience, but they experience going to sleep and being unable to move or waking up and being unable to move, that's again, that's, that's spots your awareness. But if, but if you, are, you practice to the point of what I call state acquisition, if you practice state acquisition to the point that you can go from the conscious beta awareness state all the way through alpha, all the way through data, theta, all the way through delta into the out-of-body experience consciously, every single time you will experience the paralysis state, even if only briefly. So what I learned to do was you could do one or two things. If you, if you have the paralysis and, you, and it's uncomfortable for you, you could do one or two things. You can either end the, end the paralysis by trying to move something small, like focus on moving a pinky or moving a, a toe. 
And I found that that's all, that's, a, that's an easy way to accelerate the end of the experience. Or you can initiate the out-of-body experience. Because when you're in paralysis, you're either in deep theta or light delta. And we mm-hmm. can talk about the states in more detail in, in a moment if you like. But you, you're either in deep theta or light delta, which is the prime state to initiate the out-of-body experience. So all you have to do is when you're in paralysis, just relax. Just deeply relax and let go. And then move. Either move manually by trying to roll to the side or sit up or move with your intent by willing yourself to float or by intending yourself to be at a different location and you will experience the out-of-body state. So there really is no way to go be- from waking to sleeping without experiencing the paralysis state. It's just a natural part of, of, our, of the human sleep process. Okay. Right. Okay. Well, when it comes to um, you lay down, you go to sleep, Take us through a typical um, OBE, you know, the feelings that you get and, and okay. how it goes through the motions. Okay, so, I'm, so I'm, if I'm manually, go, manually going out of body, straight from the conscious state, straight to the, to the out of body state, usually I would start by uh, one of various meditations. Like, like I said, there's, there's various techniques to use. One of my favorite is what I call the, the four to two rhythmic breathing techniques. So I would sit down. I would relax myself, I would inhale to the count of four, hold my breath to the count of two, exhale to the count of four, hold my breath to the count of two. I would keep this rhythm going as I relax, and I would start to enter an altered state. So an altered state is basically any uh, awareness or state that you have that's different from the conscious beta state awareness. So the next state is alpha. At the alpha state, you'll start to feel relaxed. Uh, You'll start to see globules of light, usually from here it's yellowish. So I would start to see, let's say, yellowish dots behind my eyelids. Uh, as I start to go deeper and deeper into all the states, into deeper alpha, usually they would start to form some kind of a shape. For me, a common shape is a, a dot or a circle in the middle of my field of vision, you know, the, the area behind my closed eyelids. Mm-hmm. And uh, this dot would start to expand in radiating circle. So you imagine a circular yellowish dot with these yellowish circles radiating from it over and over. So now I know, okay, I'm in alpha. And then this will start to get more and more uh, uh, animated, maybe different shapes and globules will start moving around. And I will start to experience a very quiet mind or even a very active mind. Like I'll notice that my conscious awareness is a shift in my, in my way of thinking. Uh, and I know, okay, I'm in deep alpha. So depending on what my intentions are, I may sit in deep alpha for a while and contemplate something. Or if I want to go into that about experience, I'll proceed, proceed into theta. So now I'm in deep alpha. Uh, maybe I'll con- continue sitting down or maybe I'll decide to go lay down. Uh, and I will probably switch to a different exercise. Uh, let's say I would, I would decide to visualize a shape or uh, count from 50 to 1. Any of the various exercises I have that you know, pretty much any, any meditation technique would do. So let's say I decide to count uh, backwards from 50 to 1. I will start counting from 50 to 1. Just 50 in my mind, 49, 48. 47 as I lay down and relax and I will start to go deeper and deeper into all the states and what will, what will happen is when I reach light theta I will start to see flashes of color so if you if you have your eyes closed and you see a monotone sort of colors image you're an alpha but if you see colored images images with, with multiple colors in it you know you're in theta so that's how I'll be laying down counting from 50 to 1 and I will see a flash of someone's face okay, I know I just entered theta I will keep on counting and keep on relaxing, and maybe I'll see an image of a, of a scene. Maybe I'll see an, an image of a nature scene, a full-color nature scene with, with trees and a mountain. And, and okay, I know I'm entering deeper and deeper into theta. And eventually, I will, that, that imagery would just fill my screen, fill my, the, the area behind my eyelids so as if I'm looking at a movie. Uh, maybe I'm looking at, uh, maybe I, suddenly I see an image like I'm looking at a football game, or suddenly I see... Uh, you know, just like I'm looking at a movie, just something, some, uh, some multicolored, full screen visual images playing behind my eyelids. That's, you know. So then I might switch to one of my, uh, my patented technique, what I call the relaxed move technique. Where I'm in deep theta, I know I'm on the verge of having an out of body experience. So what I would do, what is actually counter to what a lot of people will say is possible, but I would actually relax. And I would regularly move. So I would relax, just relax deeply and deeply. And I would move into a different position. Let's say I will move to my side. 
yeah. which will slightly bring me out of an altered state. I turn onto my side. I will start to relax again, and I will start to go very quickly back into deep theater. I'm looking at imagery. I'm looking at this full screen uh, uh, play play out before my eyes. I will relax and relax for a few more minutes. Then I will move to a different position. So I will just keep on relaxing, keep on moving. Each time I, I get to a new position and relax, the, the visual images just start to play out again. And eventually what happens is I'm immersed in the imagery. Now I know I'm in deep theta or light delta. So now I'm, not, now I'm not just looking at an image on in front of my eyes. I am in the imagery. Now instead of looking at a, a football field, the football players play, I'm, I'm in the football field. You know, they're throwing me the football, right? I'm in the imagery. And what happens is, since I made a habit of relaxing and moving, I go to move again, then I realize I'm paralyzed. I can't move. And, and I, may have, I may have even start, started to accept the imagery as real, because at that point, you're basically in, the, in a lucid dream. But I go to move, I feel paralyzed. Okay, now I know I'm in Delta. I can't move. I'm in full paralysis. So then I relax. I sit up out of body. I feel myself peeling up out of body. It feels like I'm moving through molasses. I'm heavy. And, and then I'm in the out-of-body experience. And, wow. of course, several things can happen. Sometimes they might end immediately. Yeah. Or sometimes I might roll out and crawl away and it ends. And, of course, sometimes I roll out and I go flying through the universe. So, But, but that's a basic a general progression. And, of course, it can happen all different kind of ways, especially da depending on what, what technique you use. Right. Dave Lloyd's asking, but don't we just do that anyway when we go to sleep, um, see images in our minds due to melatonin? Well, I mean, I'm not sure if, uh, what... Uh, different uh, physical or physiological, physiological chemical is related to it. But yes, it is a natural part of sleep. As I said, there's no way you get to the out of body experience without your physical body going to sleep. Mm. So all the different things you experience on the way to the out of body experience are the things that everybody experiences on the way to sleep. It's just that most people are not aware of it because their, their conscious awareness is not trained or developed enough to remain conscious through it. But if, you, but if you're conscious as you go to sleep, yes, you will experience that. Uh, that, that does not uh, 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 negate the experience. That, that's not, that does not say the experience itself is a dream. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't, ex I don't expect anybody to believe that. You don't have to believe it. No. All you have to do is have the experience yourself and test it. And, and you, can, you can validate for yourself that it's a real experience. But yes, you, you will experience that as you go to sleep. It's a natural part of sleep. It's called hypnagogic imagery. When you, when you go towards sleep, and you see the flashes of lighter imagery. It's called hypnagogic going into sleep. And when you're waking from sleep and you see that imagery, it's called hypnopompic. So that, that's, that's a normal uh, physiological uh, state. You know, you can see read it in science books. Does the pineal gland um, come into this? The pineal gland, whichever you pronounce it. Pineal. Pineal gland. Does that I, I, I have experience that suggests so mm -hmm. at, at one period of time as a child and even today. Like if I don't practice for a long period of time and I start practicing again, I will experience this. I will experience a click in the middle of my head. And uh, at one period of time when I was a kid doing one of my floating uh, uh, um, you know, periods of time, I would lay down and go to sleep. And uh, suddenly I become aware and I would hear this loud click or bang in the center of my head. This click or this bang like a shotgun. Uh, shooting off and right after I would hear this click off I would go floating, floating into the air and uh, let's say I would just sit there floating at the ceiling all night and then you know when it's time for me, for me to wake up in the morning I would float back down to my body and, and click I would hear this click in my head then I would be active in my physical body again and uh, I would later read uh, the works of uh, Sylvan Muldoon and he said it was based upon the pineal gland and uh, it's possible you know, I, I I don't really know how you would be able to really yeah. prove that except but to, you know, maybe they could put some kind of device in somebody's head to see what the pineal, pineal gland is doing. Uh, so I can't really say for sure. But I have had that experience where I would hear this click in the middle of my head, which some people say was the pineal gland activated or not. You know? okay. So that's, that's the experience I have with that. We have one question from Monkey Hypnoman. Do you have a training pro program at all? Uh, yes, uh, 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 I have my book, Travel 4. I have or every single technique I have up in there. Uh, I also offer personal uh, 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 counseling on the subject as well as uh, one of the things I did to validate the experience. Like over the years, I taught you know dozens if not hundreds of people to have the experience. And, uh, and what I did was in 2012 in preparation to put the book out, I went out to different medical, physical forums and stuff and said, hey, 
You know, I'm going to have a book coming out soon. I'm going to, uh, I'll teach you all my, 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 uh, I'll give you personal coaching on, coaching on the experience. All you have to do is just keep good journals and, and let me know what's going on with you so I could just refine the techniques or whatever. And it was a two month step. Taught so many people to have all the states and have the experience, and you know what I do now. I take that format and I and I offer a uh, two month training course. So you either have the book you can buy a travel for, uh, you can have post personal coaching, or you can join the two month uh, intensive training program where I basically teach you over the course of two months how to have it based upon the, the techniques in the book. So those are three ways that I uh, offer offer instruction. Okay, Steve. Okay. Yeah. Uh, did. Uh First of all, a, a, a quick one for our listeners who uh, might want to try this. Uh, is there any danger of not being able to get back to your body? No, in my experience, there's no danger, even though you can have the experience of not getting back in. Now, uh, that doesn't mean danger. Uh, to, to give you what happened was, and we could talk about the whole experience if you like, but I got a variety and I went and experienced a bunch of things, and I came back, and uh, I went to go lay back into my body and get into the body, and I couldn't. And, uh, okay, I said, okay, this is weird. And I tried to wool myself back in the body, and I couldn't. And I guess I was, like, around in my early 20s at this period of time. So I was, I've, been, I've been having experiences for, you know, like, o- like over a decade at this period of time. So I wasn't worried. I was just like, uh, okay, I can't, I, can't, I can't get back into my body right now. So I just, I just stood there and just waited. <laughs> I just sat down and just waited for a while. And, uh, and eventually I woke up in the morning. And what I realized you know, putting all of my experiences together, uh, putting together the experience of seeing people out of body while they were asleep, even though they didn't remember in the, mo- in the morning. What I have concluded is this. You know, whenever we go into the Delta state, whenever we go into the Delta state, which is the deepest level of sleep, whenever we do this, we have an out-of-body experience. Mm-hmm. Most of the time, we just hover close to the physical body, either a few inches out or floating at the ceiling like I experienced as a child. Or sometimes we go around exploring, we just don't remember it because we haven't trained ourselves to bring that information back to conscious awareness. When your physical body is in deep delta, if there is no pressing thing to wake you up, you will not be able to get back into your physical body because you would normally be out of body at that time anyway. You know, So it's kind of like if you're in a car uh, uh, and, and the car is in drive, you know, the car is going to move. You know, that's, that's just the way the call works. So if you're in Delta, you will be separated from your physical body. That's just the way it works. So if, if you go back to your physical body and your physical body is in deep Delta, you may experience not being able to get back in. But if you just wait a little while and, and wait till your physical body wakes up some, you'll be pulled back in, right? So, so that's just the way it works. Uh, now, that's not to say that if you're in deep Delta and sleep and your house catches on fire, you won't be able to wake up because, as we all know, if we're sleeping and the baby starts crying or something falls and make a big noise and, we, and we're afraid something is about to hurt us, of course we'll wake up. That's, just, that's, that's also a physical imperative. Uh, but if there's no physical press, pressing thing like having to urinate, you know, that'll pull us out. If there's nothing to physically interrupt your physical body or some physical threat to your physical body that will awaken you, if you go back to your physical body and is in Delta, you may experience being not able to get in. All you have to do is just wait a little while, and your physical body will start to wake up a bit, and uh, you'll be either be able to get back in, or you'll just get pulled back in as your physical body wakes up. So it's no big deal. Uh, in my experience, there's no danger at all. Okay. Yeah, uh, it's interesting what you say there. I mean, one night, uh, Sue went to bed, early and I stayed up and when I when I went up she uh, she was obviously dead to the world now I I got into bed and I looked over and there was a shimmering form should I say next next to the bed could this have been Sue having an OBE definitely definitely because every time we go to sleep we have it and uh, most people who are not consciously aware are uh, uh, doing the experience. That's, that's what they mostly do. They they hover close to their physical body. They hang somewhere close to their physical body. So it's very likely that you simply saw her in a non-physical state as her physical body was in deep sleep, was in deep delta. Happens every single time. Wow. Oh God. Yeah, I saw you. <laughs> I, I saw you have an OBE suit. <laughs> okay. Yeah. The the left side of uh, several areas of the brain is is associated with uh, kinesthetic I- imagery uh, and are responsible for uh, extracorporeal experiences or ECEs 
Uh, and this gives the sensation of being out of the body and hence feel like an OBE. So how do, how do we work out the difference whether this is happening or whether we're actually having an OBE? That, that's a very common question. And I would say that really the only way to do it is through experience. Through, through, through experience and testing the experience. And uh, what happens is over, over time, you will be able to discern just from experience. You know, uh, a good example is uh, uh, at my friend Lewis I was telling you about, who, who was like a, a, a master out of body experiencer. And uh, I decided to both test myself and test him and test the experience, right? So what I did was I decided to go out of body and see him out of body, but not tell him I was going to go out of body and see him out of body. And at that period of time, we spoke on the phone every day. Not, not only about metaphysical stuff, but just, you know, about anything. We just spoke, spoke on the phone every day. So what I decided to do was to make the experience such that there would be no question in my mind that we actually had met through the out-of-body experience. So uh, one thing that, that, that you, you notice with the out-of-body experience is you can change your appearance. You can make yourself look any way you want. As a matter of fact, for a certain period of time, in my, like my late teens or, 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 or somewhere around that time, I actually made myself look female. Whenever I went out of body, my non-physical self looked like a female. You can make yourself look however you want. So what I did was, before I went out of body, I, I dressed myself in my mind and my intention in a long white robe. And on this robe, I put a gold band around the center. So you imagine a big white robe. Uh, long sleeve robe, and but there's a gold band around the center of my chest on this robe, and uh, you know I went, I did my thing, I went out of body and saw Lewis, and oh, and I also, I also uh, uh, determined I would, I would say some strange thing like pineapple or something, like I made some kind of phrase I would say that we would not normally say to each other that I would tell him, and he can tell me what I said when I got back, you know, when we were, when we, when we were both back in body. Yeah. I don't remember what the phrase was, but. Uh, I went, I went into an altar state, had the intention to see Lewis, and I remember seeing Lewis, but this, this was one of my experiences where I was, not, I was not fully conscious. And I was semi-conscious, but I was there, I was groggy. I remember seeing Lewis, I remember talking to him, and, uh, and the experience ended after a while, and, and I woke up the next day. So, when we talked on the phone the next day, I didn't tell him anything about it. We started talking about sports and whatever. And uh, he said, oh, hey, you know, I saw you out of body last night. I said, oh, really? And he was like, you was, wearing, you was wearing this big silly shirt with a gold line around the middle of it. I was like, really? And he was like, you look like you were drunk. Right? So he, he got that I was groggy. I wasn't fully conscious. He got that I was wearing a big white robe, which he called a big white shirt. And he got that there was a gold band around the center of it. I mean, you know, so, so I mean, that's just one, one example of experiences where I validated, uh, uh, you know, my interactions with someone else. Mm. So... You know, some people might use that to say, oh, I could plug this electrode through your brain and simulate this part of your brain, and you have the same experience, so it's, it's obviously not real. You know, I don't really know what to say about what they're experiencing. I haven't really, uh, uh, you know, looked much into it because this is really not important to me. I mean, if, if someone's trying to prove it's not real, no. it doesn't really, really interest me so much. No. I'm like, have the experience and let's validate it. Like, I know it's real. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, it could be that they're stimulating the out-of-body experience by putting a, a physical body into an altered state. Because, again, every time you go out of body, there is a comparative change to the physical body. Every time you go out of body, the brain, the physical brain enters the delta sleep state. So, if you can some kind of way, and, and, and Lewis validated that, validated that himself. The, the Memorial Institute validated that. I'm sure you've heard of the Memorial Institute with their, uh, uh, you know, they put the electrodes in the brain and see what state the brain is in during these altered states. Yeah. I mean, so it's a fact that when you go into Delta, you have the out of body experience. Uh, Lewis went to a sleep lab and they hooked him up to the machine. And every time he went into the out of body experience, they said his brain was in Delta. They said it basically was like he was putting himself into a coma. So it's, it's logical to conclude that if you have a way to put the, put the brain into the, out of, into the Delta state, the person can have, you know, an out-of-body experience, which is what the Mount Royal Institute does. They learn to make these uh, sound waves and train the brain to go into theta and delta that the person has an out-of-body experience. And, uh, uh, you know, and they get validated that several times as well. You know, some, sometimes they go as a group and, 
and meet up and, and confirm these things. So, uh, but, you know, specifically with the electrodes, I'm not sure, that, that, that never really interested me to look into. Uh, I could just say that uh, you believe that means the experience is a dream, that's simply not the case. Okay. And uh, all you have to do is just have the experience yourself and test it. And, uh, and you can validate yourself that it's a real experience. Right. Now, most people may not remember what happens, but you seem to remember more or less everything. Why do you think this is? What makes you be able to, able to recall so much? Is it down to your meditation, your psychic awareness? Um, yes, that's what it is. Now, as a kid, you know, I can't really say what made it happen spontaneous that initially. Uh, uh, at, after it first started happening, when I started to try to make it happen, what I ended up doing was practicing meditation in, in, in altered states. So what I've learned over the years of practicing as well as teaching other people, as well as, uh, you know, for a time I read every single book on it, mm. what, I, what I found is just a matter of training yourself to push what I call your awareness threshold back. So what happens is everyone has what I call an awareness threshold. You have a point through the consciousness spectrum at which you lose awareness. So, if you look into the brainwave states, we have our conscious state, which is, which is what we're in right now, which is called beta. You have a slightly relaxed state, even when watching television, when you're, into, when you're into that receptive state where you're not really thinking, you go into alpha where your brain waves are a bit slower. Uh, when you go into that, as one of the uh, 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 persons on the uh, talk, uh, on the chat mentioned, you have the hypnagogic and the hypnopopic state, that's theta, where you see the colored imagery. And then you have delta, which is the deepest state of, state of sleep, or, where it's deep coma, the deepest, slowest brainwave state. Now, when you're going to sleep at night, if you, when you go to sleep, you see colored images and then you lose awareness, you know that your awareness threshold is at theta. Yeah. Or if you, when you go to sleep and you don't see anything, you just remember closing your eyes and that's it, you know your awareness threshold is at light alpha. So wherever you lose awareness, that's where your awareness threshold is at. What I found is with anyone, and this goes with anyone, it's not that I'm special. If you practice all the states or what I call state acquisition enough, what you do is each time you practice, you push your awareness threshold back. So if you sit down and you do that fortitude meditation I, I talked about, and you start to, to practice more and more and more, at some point you'll lose awareness. At some point your head will just fall to the side, and then you'll... Your head falling will alert you. You realize, wow, I just lost awareness just this moment. But when I lost awareness, I saw this yellowish color. You keep on practicing day after day, and without without realizing it, you'll start to notice, wow, I'm starting to see colored images now. Your awareness threshold has pushed to theta. And as you practice more and more and more, your awareness threshold will push to delta. So that eventually you'll start to be able to consciously go into the delta state, roll out of body into the out of body state, run back to your physical body and wake up with full awareness of everything that happens. And of course, it does not, you know, it doesn't you normally move that smoothly. What will start to happen is you'll start to practice and you start to be, become aware of imagery. And let's say you might go to sleep at night and you may remember your out-of-body experience. It'll start to happen in bits and pieces. Wow, I remember floating out last night, you know. And as you practice more and more, you'll start to be usually into theta and then you'll start to remember bits and pieces of more out-of-body experiences. Then as you practice more and more, you'll start to consciously enter deep data, where you start to experience that experience I talked about where you, you, you're you suddenly in a lucid dream. Suddenly mm -hmm. now, you, you sat down to meditate, and then you lay down to go to sleep, and instead of seeing just flashes of images, now you're in the middle of a, of a movie. Now you know your conscious awareness threshold that's pushed back to deep data, and you'll start to experience more more out-of-body experiences or more things that happen during an out-of-body experience. And eventually those those little breaks in the de delta will start to become a full conscious memory. And what happened is at, at, at one period of time when I practiced a lot, like I was, I was let's say, um, my late teens, uh, uh, it was summer times, so I was out of school, uh, I didn't have to work. And pretty much all I did was practice this stuff. And I reached a point to where I was literally conscious 24 hours a day. I never lost awareness. I would, e I would either be conscious in my physical body walking around or I would be conscious in a non-physical state, which was kind of drawing to me. So I stopped practicing, practicing for a while to sort of let the divide reestablish itself. But, uh, but if you practice enough, your threshold pushes back far enough where you simply never lose awareness. So it's just a matter of training ourselves by practice uh, to push our awareness threshold back. Anyone can do it. And, uh, and as I said, you know, it, it usually is, it happens where 
you know, uh, you have your conscious threshold pushing back. And then the farther your threshold pushes back, you'll start to have more and more little bits of memory of Delta and Theta, more and more bits of memories of dreams. That's how it'll start. You'll start to remember your dreams more. Right now, you might go to sleep and you wake up and it was just nothing but darkness. Mm -hmm. And as you start to practice, you start to be conscious and alpha. And you say, wow, I had a dream last night. Well, you always have a dream. You just, you just wasn't aware of it. Then you start to remember more and more dreams. Then you start to experience more and more flashes of of delta out of body experiences and your threshold starts to push back and eventually there's a, there's a connecting point where you're just aware of everything all the time okay um dave lloyd said um he sees what you're saying um but it must take a lot of practice and he goes on to ask how often do you have obes well i mean it's just a matter of how much i practice right now really that i haven't practiced in a while so I'm, i've been out of practice yeah uh but if i practice i can have it every day Wow. So it's just a matter of practice. It's just, it's just with anything, you know. Uh, uh, um, I used to be a drummer, you know, and I used to practice every day. Yeah. And I used to be able to get on the drum and play anything I could imagine. Any beat I can imagine, I'll be able to play it. Mm. I cannot do that now. No. <laughs> I never practiced for a long time. Okay. But when I practice, I'm as fluid as a, as, as a yeah. Yeah. sports or anything. Now, so, yeah. the, the, for, for our um, – you. UFO enthusiasts out there, I believe you've encountered extraterrestrials during your OBEs. Can you tell us a bit about this? Yes, I have. I've had several uh, encounters with, uh, with extraterrestrials. Uh, uh, my first ones was as a child. Uh, around the time I started to have out of body experiences, I started to have them more regularly. And it could be that I started to remember the experiences because I started to push my threshold back to remember it. I would see gray aliens very regularly. Uh, I would just suddenly become aware, standing in the living room, and the gray alien being would be standing in the doorway of the front door of the house. Like the front door of the house would be open, and an alien being would be standing there. And I, you know, I can't be absolutely certain how much of it was physical or how much was was non-physical. I'm sure I've had uh, over the over the years some of it was probably not. Some of it was physical, and some of it was a blend. Mm -hmm. But uh. I would see this gray alien just standing in the doorway looking at me. And I would just be staring, you know, looking at him. And, uh, uh, and this would happen nightly, nightly. Uh, and sometimes I would, I, would, I would go to the door and walk out the door. And uh, uh, sometimes I would see this alien craft floating right above, right in front of the house, right over the tree. And this particular craft looked like the shape of it reminded me of an outstretched hand. Like if you take your hand. And you put your fingers together, so your finger, your hand is flattening your fingers together. That's how I was shaped, but just floating in the air. Uh, other times, I would walk out into the middle of the street, and I would see fleets of craft going across the sky. And uh, uh, you know, through the years, of course, I've researched this as well: ETs, UFOs, uh, aliens. And uh, there was this lady named Kim Carlsberg, one of, whose book I read, and she had the same exact experience. And uh, what she found was that. You know, she had a lot of physical encounters with ETs, and uh, during this period of time, she would have dreams like these crafts going across the sky that related to her ET encounters. Um, over the years, I started to uh, become a lot more interested in the subject uh, uh, and started to actually consciously, and, and before this experience, by the way, another experience I had as a kid was, you know, I, I, would, I, would, I would become aware out of body. And either sit and like sit up out of body, and uh, these three beings would be standing next to my bed, and uh, I perceived them to be beings of light, like just light beings, and they would just pour information into my mind. They would just put streams and streams of information telepathically directly into my mind, and this this happened for an extended period of time, like months or, 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 or at, at least. And um, when I read the the book of this uh, UFO researcher. Her name was, Ke uh, I can't remember her name exactly, Turner, K Karen Turner, I believe, something Turner. And uh, what she found was several of her contactees, she researched a lot of contactees, and these ETs would sit, three of them, and stand in a semi-circle. So I don't really know if those were actual physical beings or uh, non-physical beings at the time. Uh, eventually, what I started to do was, when I started to research ETs and their stressors and get really into it, I decided to actively pursue seeing them. And uh, through my research, my observation, I knew that they were telepathic. So uh, what I started to do was I started to sit in meditation. You know, I, you know as we discussed, I got pretty adept at meditation. And uh, I would go on.
eight. And I would telepathically call out to any extraterrestrials that were in the, in the area. Let them know, hey, I want to see you. I want to see your craft. I want to see you. you know, I want to know that you're real. You know, let me see. Let me see. Every day for about a month, I would do this. I would go into an alter state every single day and call out to them. Well, what happened is I was coming home from work one day. Uh, I guess I was like in my early 20s, mid-20s at the time. And uh, I saw these pink flashes in the clouds, in the distance, in the sky. And, uh, you know, from my research, I knew that's not like some kind of natural phenomenon. So I, I assumed it must be some kind of ET activity. So I started driving towards the craft. And I determined that that flash in the sky could be two states away. I'm going to drive until I get to those flashes in a, in, a, in a cloud. So as I was driving to those flashes, I happened to be driving straight to my home. I didn't have to make any unusual turns like I thought I would. So I actually passed up my subdivision, passed up my street, and I drove about six blocks down from my home. And, uh, and I was like about three blocks away from the flashes at this point. Wow. So I parked my car, and I'm just looking at this flash on the clouds. It was flash pink. That's, that's what, what color it was. Then it would go off. Then it was flash pink. Then it would go off. And then, then it started flashing faster and faster and faster. And at this point, I'm starting to get nervous and afraid. So, uh, you know, I, I, was, I was anticipating when I saw a craft that I would just, you know, get out and walk up to it and say, you know, beam up Scotty, you know. But I was getting kind of nervous. And uh, suddenly the, 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 the clouds started flashing faster and faster and faster until it wasn't flashing anymore. It was just a solid pink light. So you can imagine, you know, the, the sky is over, over, overcast yeah. with clouds. There's just one section of the, of, the, of the clouds about three blocks away, solid pink. And suddenly this craft hovers, out, hovers down out of the cloud. Okay. Uh, it was this beautiful craft. Uh, it looked like what a lot of people describe as like a Pleiadian beam ship or something. Not exactly. Uh, when, I look, when I looked online, I saw these pictures, these images of uh, the Gulf Breeze sighting. So if you, ever, if you look online and, and there's research Gulf Breeze UFO, you know, and look at the craft that, 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 you know, that's image there. You know, I can't really tell you if those pictures are real or not. I can't really tell you if it's a photograph, a, a photograph or a Photoshop. I can just tell you that I've seen the craft myself with my own eyes that looks exactly like what those images look, right? Uh -huh. And I didn't see those images until after I saw my craft, by the way. Okay. But I saw it foot out, out, the, out, the, out the cloud. And at this point, I'm freaking out. I'm making sure the windows are rolled up. I'm, I'm just like freaking out, thinking I'm about to get abducted or whatever. And uh, suddenly, I see the craft floating back up into the clouds. I just noticed that it just seemed kind of strange. It seemed like something was missing. When I got back home, an hour and a half had passed. So uh, in between the time that the craft came out of the cloud and to the time that the craft went back up in the cloud, there's an hour and a half that I cannot account for. You know, we've heard of missing time. Mm -hmm. So that was my first, uh, uh, um, you know, direct encounter uh, that I've initiated. And, uh, and uh, after that experience, you know, about, uh, about a week or two around that period of time, I also saw a big giant uh, uh, colored area of the clouds near that same area. Uh, and this, this black unmarked helicopter, what I perceived to be, a black unmarked helicopter was flying straight to it. Uh, we could talk about the helicopter more as well. But uh, and then another time, I was coming from work. I used to work. Uh, I used to get off from work at about eleven at night. So usually when I got out of work, it was nighttime. I saw some flashes in the, in the clouds, and I decided to drive till I saw the flashes. And I saw about a dozen of these things. They, they didn't fly out. They didn't come out of the cloud this time. But I saw like a dozen of these pink areas of the cloud glowing over the lake. And you can see the pink light, you know, shining down on the lake. And uh, over to the side of the lake, there was just sort of, uh, I don't know, some kind of theme park or some kind of, there was some kind of area where all the buildings looked like little castles and stuff. And one of the craft was directly over the, the castle. You could see the light coming from the cloud. You could see it shining off the castle. I mean, something was definitely there. Yeah. Uh, so it was uh, another time I was driving from Georgia. And uh, I saw these two. Again, pink clouds way in the distance. And uh, I'm just driving towards that direction. And suddenly, I see this like pink lightning go from one cloud to the other. And both of these lights just take off over my car. So if you, if you imagine, like the, at the horizon, there's these pink clouds. And mm -hmm. this pink light moves from that horizon 
to the horizon behind me so fast that there's this big pink streak going across the, the sky if, if I'm communicating it properly. Oh, so, man. I mean, whatever it was, it moved so fast yeah, yeah. that it moved from horizon to horizon that the, there was two pink lines of light across the whole horizon. And they disappeared by, in my rear, rear view mirror behind the horizon before the light disappeared. So there's this big giant streak of light going across the sky. It was it was quite amazing. So that pretty much sums up my uh, yeah. consciously initiated uh, experiences. And ironically, uh, where I'm working on now is trying to get a group together to experience it because I, I, I want to get to the point to where I am conscious the whole time. I can have a conscious interaction and I, and I can actually get on the craft. So I'm working on now building a group so I can have a group of 5 to 20 people and just like how I did with the uh, out of body thing, where I got I had a, a research study together, and I and I and all together it was like twenty people. Of course, not everybody stuck with it, but I had a research study where I taught people how to have the out of body experience. And uh, now what I'm working on is is the research study where I get you know so many people to have the ET experience. Yeah. And uh, I'm a I'm a I'm a uh, established being able to have a group encounter, so then I can start encounters themselves okay. as well. Right, Steve's got one more question yeah. for you. Yeah, uh, Dave Hufford in '89 uh, linked the OBE experience uh, with a phenomenon that he describes as nightmare walking experience, a type of sleep paralysis. Uh, but but when we sleep, uh, we lose some of the sensory input, but retain uh, the memory of, of what is around us and the last thing we heard, like maybe our mum or our partner going into the kitchen to wash up. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and our brain, being the powerful instrument that it is, creates an imagery and hence an, an OBE or lucid dream. Could this be an explanation f for some OBEs? Yeah, I'm sure I can. I mean, the fact is, uh, some experiences are uh, uh, imagery experiences, what I call the imagery trap. So uh, the fact is, some things that people may mistake to be out of body experiences are things they're imagining, things they're hallucinating, uh, and there's some things that people think are hallucinations that are actually out of body experiences. So I mean, the fact is that does happen. That that's true. The only way you'll really be able to discern is to practice enough that you can start being able to tell the difference. You know, and uh, you know, and it's really that's the only way to tell. But I mean, that that is true. That does happen, and and that doesn't really mean that that's not real to a certain extent either. Because uh, one experience, what I call mental projection, like uh, sort of like remote viewing. Now, when I say remote viewing, remote viewing actually refers to uh, uh, a sort of protocol. Like uh, it, was, it was originally started in the military, and they developed certain protocols to help censor or, or help remove our own projections into the data that we perceive. But really the foundational skill of remote viewing, in my experience and understanding, is clairvoyance. What we call clairvoyance or or or, or it's like that they've made a sort of uh, 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 strategic way to apply it. Okay? Now, if you were to sit down right now, if you were to sit down right now and let's say imagine your bedroom. You, you've been to your bedroom several times. You know what your bedroom looks like. You imagine your bedroom, okay? You can do this, and yet you can learn something new about your bedroom. This, this is a good example. Uh, one of the ways that I, I, I teach people to practice mental projection, you can, you can oh, exercise okay. like I teach several different basic exercises to help develop, to push your threshold back. One of them is mental projection. You could also use it practically. So let's say you've lost your keys. Let's say you've lost your keys. You don't know where your keys are. Okay, you know they're in your room somewhere. You know what your bedroom looks like, but you don't know where your keys are. So what you can do is you can sit down, you can close your eyes, you can imagine your keys, imagine what your keys look like, and imagine yourself looking at your keys as if it's right in front of your face. And what you can do is you can move your imagined perspective back. You, you, you're imagining, of course, you're imagining from memory your keys. You move your imagined, memorized uh, a visualization of your keys back as if you're walking back from your keys and you see where your keys are, you know, and you, and, and when you do this properly and you actually find an item that you've missed, it can be quite startling and you, and you can see how the, the fact is imagination and the memory doesn't mean that there's still a valid experience there. So you can actually have an out of body experience that you project your own memories and imaginations onto. Uh, you can have a memory that opens up into an actual uh, experience 
a non-physical perception. So at a certain point, all of those things really blend together. And, uh, you know, part of it goes to the fact is that really the whole universe is a dream. Really, everything is a dream. Everything is a dream. The physical world is a dream, and the non-physical world is a dream. But from our normal experience, from our normal perception, we see the physical world as real. And from that perspective, the out-of-body experience is just as real. It's just as valid. So if you see the physical world as valid, you, you have to see the non-physical world as valid. Or you can re recognize it's all an illusory, illusory experience. But that still doesn't mean that you can have a, objective we should say we can say perceptions and experiences within the, within the world. So um, uh, I, I talk about dreams. Uh, what we normally call dreams is basically just our subconscious or, or, or imaginings. When you go to sleep and you imagine things, it's really your subconscious imagining. It's happening only in your mind. Uh, if you imagine your neighbor killing you, or you imagine killing your neighbor, you don't wake up and see your neighbor murdered. Okay, right? Okay. Good. I hope not. Go and right? sleep. Uh, yeah. Good. Uh, but, but but this is the thing. <laughs> Even those imaginings are thought. Yeah. Even those imaginings are energy. This is the way you can you can you can prove this to yourself. If you and this is another practice I teach called uh, uh, which I got from Robert and Moe called making a place there. Okay, we just discussed your imaginings are not real. Okay, but if you sit down and imagine the same thing over and over, what happens is the energy the energy that you are forming whenever we, whenever we imagine anything, even our dreams. We're actually having an effect on thought. It is thought. It is energy. And this thought, if we hold it long enough, actually influences non-physical matter. It actually has an effect on non-physical matter and molds non-physical matter. As a matter of fact, what we call the non-physical dimensions are actually non-physical matter or energy molded by humanity. Right. That's why uh, you have what's called the belief system zones, where you can go into the non-physical area and you see these areas that match different belief systems because we actually form those areas. Now, if you sit down yourself and let's say you imagine your dream home and you keep visualizing this dream home over and over every day, what happens is your personal imagining starts to open up into the actual non-physical realm and most the non-physical realm to the point that you can go out of body and go to this area and experience it as an actual realm. Other people can go out of body and experience it as an actual realm. It started as you're imagining, but it can open up into being an actual non-physical dimension that you can go out of body and experience, that other people can go out of body and experience. Okay? Okay. If, you, if you don't imagine it, if you stop going there for an extended period of time, and let's say you go back after a year, you can go back to this area and see that it's starting to decompose itself. You know, your home is now half home and have this amorphous energy. And you can actually start to see how it starts to de uh, devolve or, or back into inert non-physical matter. Okay. So uh, 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 there's a gradient. There's a gradient between only imagining an actual non-physical objective reality, and 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 there's a certain point where it sort of blends together. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We used to use a, a a technique you, you know, like that when we used to do meditation. Uh, I've got a question here for you. Uh, not everybody on the astral plane is uh, there for there for good reasons. Uh, what safeguards do you put in place before you leave your body? I don't do any at this point. Uh, 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 the fact is, there are people there that are there for bad reasons. Uh, but in my experience, in other words, everyone is just as powerful. Like even today, like a lot of people, uh, uh, like with government corruption, people talk about government corruption and government doing this. They're just human beings like us. You know, okay. we don't want them doing what they're doing. Just stop participating or, or make them stop or whatever. You know, yeah. the same thing with the non-physical, right? If there's a non-physical being who wants to do you harm, you're a non-physical being too. You're just a non-physical being still, you know, attached or, or moving through a, a physical body a lot of the time. Yeah. We're just as powerful as them, you know. Uh, so, you know, I really believe in my experience, the fear of being harmed and the fear of being vulnerable is really the more debilitating than anything a non-physical being could do. Uh, so when I was first coming up, and I started reading books about this stuff that I used to do because they said, oh, be afraid. And I used to like imagine uh, uh, um, 
you know, uh, uh, white light surrounding me, you can do that. I mean, if you're afraid, definitely address it, you know, so you can imagine yourself surrounded by white light. Uh, and, 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 and like I said, this actually has an effect. If you really imagine this, it will actually form non-physical matter and make a barrier around your physical body or a barrier around your bed. A good example of this is uh, uh, Robert, uh, not sorry, uh, Albert Taylor in his book. Uh, he was doing this practice, or, or he went to somebody else who was doing this practice. And, uh, no, I believe he was the one that was going out of body. And he traveled to somebody who would regularly visualize himself surrounded by white light or whatever. And, you know, he went out of body to visit his friend, and he could not get close to their body. Like, there was literally a field of energy preventing anything from getting close. So, if you visualize this stuff, it will have an effect on the non-physical realms, and it will put a field of energy around you. But notice what happened. It even stops somebody with good intentions from, from getting through. So, you know, uh, you know, after when I was about 20 or something, I didn't even worry about it. You know, I, 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 I used to go out of body intentionally and find non-physical beings and beat them up, you know, for fun. <laughs> you know, I, I, yeah. one time I saw this, uh, this little girl. Uh, I was still a kid myself, but at this time I probably had dozens or hundreds of out of body experience, I don't know. I would just, it was just common to me. And I was out of body, I became aware of flying in formation with these group of non-physical beings. I seemed very funny with them, like I guess we knew each other. And uh, I saw this little girl being chased by this non-physical entity. I mean, it was this little girl, and this non-physical entity looked like a giant. I mean, it was a humongous non-physical entity terrorizing this little girl. I went down and whipped his butt, you know? I went down and, and took care of it, and, 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 uh, and I took the little girl back to her physical body. So, I mean, these non-physical beings, they're just, they're just beings like us. Yeah, you know, yeah. uh, uh, another experience I had was, you know, like you said, there are non-physical, there are people who use it for bad things. There's actually people who go out of body and use it to steal people's energy. Like, uh, I researched this group who call themselves vampires. They believe that uh, the original mythos of the vampire was based upon people going out of body and stealing people. And so, like, you see that the vampire doesn't have a, an image in the mirror, and uh, the vampire could disappear in a flame, of, uh, uh, in a puff of smoke and stuff like that. But they say it was, uh, you know, uh, it's based upon non-physical vampires and with people going out of body. And uh, I guess when I bought their book from them to research them, I must have came to their... Uh, uh, attention, and, and one of them actually visited me to try to sap my energy out of body. So when you start to practice this stuff, you start to become more aware of the non-physical. Like a lot of times, if if I'm in my room and a non-physical being comes in, I'll sense it. it. It'll be like a physical person walked in that I can't see. Like a, I can feel the, the person there. I can feel the being there. And uh, you know, this being came into my room. Uh, I don't know what I was doing. I might have been watching TV, and I felt this non-physical being walk in. And I felt the telltale sensations of a vampire attack because I've, I've experienced it in physical proximity to somebody. I've, I've been close to somebody who did this. And, you know, we could talk about that as well, how I knew it was going on. But this, this non-physical being walked in the room and uh, started sapping my energy. So all I did was I just, I just uh, like I said, I visualized the uh, field of energy around my body, mm. which formed a stronger field around my body. It instantly stopped the energy savage, and the being just went away. I never heard from him again. Right. So uh, I would just say the main thing is just to start to be aware of how powerful you are. Yeah. You know, you're a powerful being. You don't have to be afraid. You could defend your. You're just as powerful as any other being. Uh, so there's, you know, so you don't have to worry about it. So I, I don't remember the last time I did anything like that. You know? Okay. If I decide to go out of body, I'm fearless. Nothing bothers me. And if something does bother me, they're going to be in trouble. I guarantee you. <laughs> yeah. So, so no, no non-physical being bothered me since I was a kid because okay. I was sending them running. You know, so you don't have to worry about that. Okay. Just before we finish up, I'm um, going to squeeze one more question in from Dave Lloyd. What's your? Um, how would you explain deja vu? In my experience, deja vu is just the 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 our, uh, the, our experience of the fact that all time is simultaneous. Like the fact is, we're aware of everything. Mm -hmm. subconsciously at the highest level of our mind there is only one mind there is only one mind in all of existence and this one mind has divided itself up and there's an experience of individual beings but really ultimately we're this we're one mind aware of everything so at certain periods of time our barriers weaken and we are aware of different times different places so it, it's just the fact that all time is now all, all, and, and, and we can be aware of everything you know when people are like Edgar Casey, you know, when he, when he went to these altered states and, 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 and learned all these things, it's more of a releasing or letting go of a barrier than gaining some new ability. 
It's like I was saying with the awareness threshold. Being aware of your out-of-body experience is really less developing some skill you don't have and more of pushing back that barrier, develop, developing your own ability to remain aware and, and, and access it. So that's all it is. You know? okay. Like I said, I used, to, I used to regularly be aware of the future. I, I would hear myself reading books. I would read year, you know, weeks into the future. Uh, 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 you know, I would be aware of something someone's going to say. Uh, I would just be aware of several things. It just that's just one of the common tendencies I have. It just so happens to be that in my psychological makeup, that future barrier is kind of broken down a bit. Maybe that's why I have these spontaneous going into the future. That just happened to be my barrier. Some people have a barrier broken down where they're just aware of telepathic thoughts a lot. You know, they read people very well. You know, so there are different people have different uh, aspects of that barrier that's broken down. But it's just it's just a, an illustration of the fact that all time is now. There is really no past, present, and future. We experience a past, present, and future because we ourselves demarcate that and then deny or repress the fact that we demarcate it. We do it at a, at a higher level of our, our psyche. And, uh, and then sometimes that barrier breaks down and we're aware of the future. And we call it a deja vu. Okay. Um, one question that mine sounds just come up with, um, and I want to ask it because it's a good question. Would you say time is a loop and are, can we move through the loop? I wouldn't say time is a loop. Uh, uh, in my experience, at, at some point, the universe will have an end. So there is a definite finite field, I would say, within which all activity happens. It's just that since all activity is happening now, yeah. if, if, we, uh, if we put ourselves at a certain frame or frequency of mind, we're above that limit. Uh, 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 and a good example, again, is the movie, right? When, you, when you're in the movie theater... When you're in the movie theater, watching a movie play out in the movie theater, that's our experience of being in the physical world. Our experience of being in a body in the physical world is that I'm in this chair, the movie is going on, and I can't affect it. You know, we're having this conversation, time is moving on, I can't just jump into the past right now, I can't just jump into the future right now. The movie is playing, I have to just watch it as it goes, accept it as it goes, right? Mm -hmm. But... If you if you move from the chair in the movie theater yeah. and move into the projector's booth, guess what you can do? You can rewind that movie and, and look at what happened in the past. You can fast forward that movie and see what's going to happen in the future. And you can press reset and go back to the present time. So all you have to do is change your perspective to the point of view that is looking down the movie rather than being in the movie that's all it is so so when i have an out-of-body experience and i go into the past uh the past or into the future or into an alternate timeline or wherever it is all i'm doing is lifting myself into a perspective where i'm looking down at the movie rather than being in the movie theater where i can where i can adjust the flowing speed of the movie where i can fast forward into the future or, or rewind it back to the past that's all it, that's all it is there's nothing really special there's nothing magical it's just your perspective Okay. You don't have to thought about it to do this. You go into a deep enough altered state, you could be aware of it. Again, that's remote viewing. So, so time and space is just a certain perspective. You change your perspective, and you're no longer bound by the in the seat perspective. That's all right. it is. Okay. Right, we're going to stop the questions in the chat room now. I just want to ask one final question. Um, your book, Travel Far, did it come out this week? Um, yes. Yes, okay. it is out. It is available now worldwide. You can get it on Amazon.com. If you go to Amazon.com and, and put Daryl Berry Travel for it, it'll, it'll come right up. Okay. So what do you expect people to get out of this book? Why did you write it? Well, I, just, I guess I just write it because it's, it's what I know. Uh, it is a passion of mine. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I wrote it because I would like to see the world progress. You know, uh, I don't think it's some kind of uh, panacea where some kind of you know, everybody learns how to out about a travel and we're in, uh, or, you know, some kind of utopian society or anything. But in my experience, the out about experience has greatly elevated my way of thinking. You know, like I've, I've been, I've become aware of different lifetimes I'm living. So there's, there's absolutely no way I can be racist. Right? Yeah. So, so how can I be racist against you because you were born in a different area of the planet when I know I have several lifetimes in that, in that same area, you know, uh -huh. yeah. or even beyond that, how can I hate another human being when I know at the core we're the same thing? You know, if I go into an altered state and go out of body, and you go into an altered state and go out of body, we don't get out of body, you know, black, white, red, and blue. We get out of body, it's, it's, you know, we're the same thing. You know, our non-physical bodies may look the way our physical bodies look, but we can leave that too. And then we're just a point of consciousness. We're the exact same thing. So I think if, 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 uh, if more people have the experience, it's not necessarily the experience themselves that will change them, but 
what, what you learn from the experience, the, the, the broader perspective you gain. I mean, racism would go away. Uh, all the fighting each other would go away. All, 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 because of all of these superficial things, it would just go away. Uh, uh, our, our, my perspective of myself has, has, has developed. Like a lot of people are afraid of death. Uh, a lot of people are afraid or, or sad when a relative dies. Of course, you, you'll still be sad if you, you know, want to be with your relative. But imagine being able to go out of body and meet your relative and know they're okay. You know, I went out of body and met my grandmother after she died. You know, I, I know she, she's still fine. You know, so, so the fear of death goes away. Uh, 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 the way that we experience our loved one's deaths will change. So, so it, it could bring a lot of peace of mind, not the experience itself, but what you could learn and glean from the experience. Uh, so, so I guess that, that's my motivation as well, just, just, just helping to see uh, humanity progress. Okay. You know, I, I think, I think, I think, being a member of humanity, we mm -hmm. have sort of a uh, a responsibility to each other and to ourselves to to develop and, and to help each other develop. So I know that. Uh, from reading it, people will be able to learn how to have the experience themselves if, if they so choose. And the more people have the experience and broaden their perspectives in these ways and other ways that we haven't even discussed yet. You know, there's so many ways that broadens your experience and, and we live our lives differently. We see ourselves differently. We see each other differently. We see the world differently. Uh, uh, and it can, it can also have an effect on consciousness, I mean, on technology, because when you look at these ET races, we were talking about ET races. Yeah. The technology interfaces with consciousness. How, 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 how was that craft able to blink on and off like that? These crafts can actually change dimensions. You know, how, how, how was it able to go from, you know, I don't know how fast that would be. I don't know how, how much difference it did. I mean, I need to research that and see how fast that craft had to be going. But I, I do know that you can't take like a Boeing 747 and go from zero to the other side of the planet. You know what I mean? You, this is so, it, yeah. so, I mean, they, they do that by being able to interface with, being able to change the frequency of their craft. So as we start to become aware of consciousness and, and, and the fluidity of consciousness, we start to be able to interface, make our, our technology work that way as well. So that opens up space travel. That opens up uh, 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 free energy. Yeah. These devices that can tap into these different frequencies of the universe and tap into so so I really believe that ultimately it expands into is one of the aspects of future Earth. It is one of the aspects of what the future Earth will be like. That's why I call uh, my company Next Density because we, we're moving into a high, higher density, a next what we call the fourth density, where instead of looking at the world from a very fragmented perspective, we see it from a more holistic perspective. Right. And if, if we look at the what we are, we are a very fragmented society. We we are aware of our beta waking state. Then we close our eyes and we don't experience anything. No, that's part of the experience of fragmentation. So in my experience, being able to consciously out of body travel, that's also an expression of more holism, a more holistic, integrated perspective. Now I don't lose awareness at beta and and, and, and don't remember anything. Now I'm conscious through beta, alpha, theta and delta. Now I've unified my awareness so that I don't more. My awareness is not fragmented so so sharply between waking and sleeping. So so it has to do with a lot of a lot of things. So that's why that's why I think is important. You know, the experience itself doesn't just make you spiritual. Not like it's not like you can just have a thousand out of body experiences and now you're enlightened. You know, but it could open your ability to learn. It can give you another tool to gather information and a broader perspective, which which to view the universe and yourself and others that you can apply what you learn to a greater and broader perspective. So that's why I think is important. Okay. On that note, well, thank you very much, Daryl. It's been brilliant having you on the show. It's been very enlightening. Um, and I wish you every success with your book and any future uh, um, endeavors that you're, you're um, building out there. So um, it's been great. Um, thank you very much awesome. for your time. Sure and welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And I uh, hope to have you back on the show again soon. I'm glad to be back soon. Let me know. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye. Well, that was Daryl E. Berry, oh, yeah. Jr. Um, interesting conversation. And uh, um, talking about – they're talking about – OBEs, out of body experiences, um, and he's definitely had quite a few, hasn't he, Steve? Just a few, yeah. So um, now, um, as you may or may not have known, we have um, been running a, a competition. Well, a competition. Uh, uh, basically, you needed to send your name in um, to get, win a copy of Daryl's book, which came out this weekend. 
and um, I'm not sure how much it is. Let me just have a look. Um, see if I can find it. Uh, bear with me. Um, see how much you're saving here. <laughs> um, but uh, the winner of the book, um, would you believe, uh, is in the chat room tonight. Um, and uh, his name is Brendan Moss. Um, he's um, managed to win this book. Um, and I hope that he enjoys it. And if you would like to email me at the same place as um, as he uh, sent the, his entry in, um, we'll get it posted up. We'll get it posted up to him tomorrow. Too sweet. So yes, or in the next couple of days. Yeah. Um, congratulations, Mossy. Yes. So uh, <laughs> um, I hope you enjoy reading it. So um, uh, as I say, we'll, we'll get this off to you. Um, and next week, let me just tell you what's happening next week. Mm -hmm. We're going from OBEs to NDEs. Um, Sue King we're going to be talking to. Um, since her near-death experience, she has realized that we are spiritual beings in a physical journey, or rather on a physical journey. Uh, the reality is that we are mortal and living in a physical world. Fortunately for Sue, life has changed dramatically since her NDE. Uh, which she originally thought had given her another bite of the cherry, a second chance. Uh, we talked to her about her near-death experience and her book, Lost in Space and Time. So uh, that's what's coming up next week. So I hope you'll join us for next week. Uh, what we're going to do now is um, we're going to uh, um, go over to the events and we'll be back in a moment. You're listening to the KTPF Community Talk Show with Steve and Suzanne Taggart, covering the supernatural, the paranormal, and other strange phenomena to keep the paranormal friendly. Fed up of wading through the activities and events that other advertisers include? Find just what you're looking for at paranormaleventsforyou.com, your one-stop paranormal directory. Okay, well, first up, we have the Tony Stockwell Tour. That continues throughout the UK. On the 10th, he's at The Lights in Andover. And on the 11th, the Pillar Room Town Hall in Cheltenham. Derek Acora is still out there with his Psychic Ether Tour. On the 9th, he's at The Maltings, the Maltings rather, in Ber Berwick-on-Tweed. And on the 12th, he's at Crook's Social Club, Sheffield. Uh, 12th of June, UK Shadow Seekers are um, doing a charity investigation for Mary Curie at the Mill Street Barracks, St Helens. Fancy that one, Mossy? Um, on the 13th of June, uh, you can join ITS Paranormal the new, uh, at the New Jerusalem Church in Wigan. Uh, also on the 13th, Ghost Caller UK um, present their first investigation at the Victorian House in Leamington Spa. On the 20th of June, the Scottish UFO and Paranormal Conference at the Pleasant Theatre, Edinburgh University. And on the 26th to the 28th, Jamaica Inn and Bodmin Jail. And you can find out more at www.jamaicarin.co.uk. And on the 27th of June, it's Paranormal ITS are at Newsham Park Orphanage. So for more information and details on these and other events, visit paranormaleventsforyou.com. ParanormalEventsForYou.com also offers banner advertising for only £10 per year. See our website for more details. ParanormalEventsForYou.com, your one-stop paranormal directory. So that's what's coming up on the events. And uh, I've already told you what's coming up next week, near-death experiences. So that should be quite interesting following tonight's show. Um, don't forget, if you're into... Um, uh, math, uh, blah, paranormal, uh, witchcraft and magic, uh, folklores, uh, earth mysteries and archaeology and ancient history, and as well as the occult, you can visit ma manmythandmagic.com, which is a specialist in second-hand books um, on a ra range of all these topics. Um, the 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 KTPF Community Talk Show is supported by Phenomena Magazine and Beyond Parazine, which are available online now. And on the subject of magazines, issue three of the KTPF 
magazine is now out and you can either read or online or download your copy via our website. Just hit online magazine which you will find on our menu bar. Uh, we are always looking for contributions from people within these subjects for example showcasing groups or highlighting haunted venues so if you're interested in contributing to the, our magazine then send your articles to editor at ktpf.co.uk if you like what you hear don't forget you can follow us via fa facebook or twitter and subscribe to our youtube channels where you will find all our past shows from the past three years and you know, Andy's not here tonight, so there's no mystery and conspiracy files. Um, so he will be back next week, um, giving you those. And um, we look forward to uh, him coming back, don't we, Steve? Yes, his silly video. <laughs> uh, now, don't forget, um, if you would like to be on the show, then email us at admin at ktpf.co.uk where we are open to discuss any specific area of this genre including ghosts, monsters, psychic phenomena or other supernatural and unexplained mysteries. Remember this is your show too, so get involved. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed tonight's show and we look forward to having your company again next Sunday at 8pm on www.ktpf.co.uk. Uh, thanks for listening to the KTPF Community Talk Show. As I said, supported by Phenomena Magazine and Beyond Parazine and sponsored by... It helps if I turn it on, doesn't it? <laughs> Try uh, again. Craigenhouse <laughs> Castle, South Wales. One of the most haunted castles in Wales. For more information on ghostly and ghastly events, including fright nights, all night investigations and hen parties, visit www.mosthauntedcastle.com Yeah, so a bit of a short one tonight, although we had a very long interview. So uh, don't forget, until next time, it's good night from me. And it's good night from her. And remember, keep, keep the, the paranormal, paranormal friendly. friendly. Good night and God bless. Good night, everyone. This is where it's at. To see in the night, to measure the spike, to see how cold it's been. I buy my kit so I won't forget the ghosties that I have seen. The Paranormal Intelligence Gathering Services Ghost Store. So visit www.the-pigs.co.uk forward slash ghost store.